so I turned on the new Netflix show, The Mechanism, and when I realized the true story that it was based on, I got really excited because it's one of the most important and interesting true stories and one of the biggest, I'd say the biggest corruption scandals ever, and you want to understand just how big an impact it had. Ten years ago, Brazil was looking to be one of the most powerful countries, one of the big emerging markets, and a large part of that was based on oil. They found a lot of oil, and this this now infamous state-run oil company was the symbol of Brazil and unity and progress, and the future looks so bright. You see Brazil getting the World Cup and the Olympics in the span of, of two years separating them. So Brazil couldn't have looked like it had a brighter future, couldn't have seen more unified, and then this scandal just rocks Brazil in general, but in particular, this symbol of their progress and of their future. And now Brazil, very, very uncertain future. The future looks very bleak. So, you know, they, they used to talk about BRICS and they used to talk about Brazil, Russia, China, India, all these emerging markets. They don't talk about that anymore. And a large part of that is just just the catastrophic fall of, of Brazil's Brazil's state in the world. And it's ongoing as well. The story's not over. They they asked the, the showrunner of this show, well, how many seasons are there going to be? And he said somewhat tongue-in-cheek, well, when the corruption's over, when the story's over, the current head of Brazil, the current president, very tied to this to this story. And the front-runner that was going to be the front-runner in the upcoming elections, he's been disqualified from, from running because, because of the, the scandal. So it's still ongoing. It's still affecting Brazilian politics. So really fascinating story. Now, if you want a quick summary of, of what the scandal was, basically this big state-run oil company, they had a lot of contracts that they would give out. So they're an oil company. So if they want an oil refinery or something built, they've got to pick a, a construction company to do it. So all the construction companies in Brazil, not all of them, a lot of the major construction companies in Brazil, they said, look, we're tired of competing. It's not good for us. What we're going to do is we're going to form a cartel. And they called it the club. And they formed this cartel. And basically they would, rather than competing for these contracts, they would just, you know, alternate and go back and forth and kind of kind of collude and make sure that that um, they didn't have to compete. What this allowed them to do is this allowed them to inflate the prices. So they had these very inflated contracts that they were making much more on the contracts than they really should have. Now, how they got the state-run oil company to agree to these inflated prices was they would just bribe them. And they would say, look, you give us you, you, you give us this contract at this inflated price, we're going to keep most of the profits from this inflated price, but we're also going to take some of those profits, we're going to put in a secret slush fund no one knows about, and then we're going to give it, give it to you. And that's a kickback. That's the, that's the term they use a lot. Now, how it goes even deeper is the Brazilian government, the government politicians, they're the ones who put these people on the state-run oil company who are in charge of giving out these contracts. So the money goes goes uh, from the, the cartel and these construction companies, it goes to the, the person giving out the contracts at the state-run oil company, and then and then some of that also goes to, to the politicians to fund their campaign so they can win re-elected. And then in return, they win re-election, they can keep picking the people on the state-run oil company, and they can keep picking the people for the inflated contracts. And now the other part of the scandal, and where the, the car wash part of the, the car wash scandal comes in so the people giving the money and giving these bribes they don't want to just give it directly because then someone could see and they could follow the trail and say wow a lot of money's going from this person to this person maybe there's something nefarious so they want to find a middleman and there's actually a word in brazil for these kind of black market banker bankers and what their job is is their job is to basically take the money from one person move it around a lot, make it very complex, launder it, make it seem clean, seem like it came from a legitimate source and just confuse the trail and then eventually give it to the person on the other end who's on the receiving end of the bribe. But they've done so much trickery and clever stuff that no one can really follow the trail and realize that it's a bribe from person A to person B. And small businesses like a car wash, like a gas station, that's a really effective way to launder money because you say, oh, the money just came from this very profitable um, car wash that actually doesn't really have any employees and doesn't really do any business, but it looks like uh, on the books, it looks like it's it's turning a profit, but really all the profits are coming from this drug money. So that's money laundering. And that's actually how they, how they laundered money in Breaking Bad was a car wash. So just an interesting parallel there. So anyways, one of these these black market bankers He's just a guy. He grew up. He was a smuggler. He'd he'd smuggle VCR VC, VCRs and and VCR tapes over over the border to Paraguay. He's a bit of a partier, larger than life figure. How he how he rose up was he realized he could do these things called plea deals. So every time he got in trouble with the police, 
He would just say, look, I'm a small fish. Give me a reduced sentence and I'll give you all the real players. And what he was able to do is he would just give up his rivals, the people that were the biggest threats to him. So he would, one, he would avoid prison. Two, he would also then be able to go back into the into the marketplace and all his rivals have been taken out. So he kept doing this over and over and over, taking these plea deals. And we see it in the in the show. The first thing we see is him doing, doing one of these plea deals. And he got very powerful. Apparently these plea deals, you know, you think people would stop working with them because they would know that he's going to, save his own skin and, and throw them under the bus but no he kept uh he kept working with people and one of the people that he was working with and he was doing this money laundering for was a really high up person at the state-run oil company and everything was fine until like i say this guy was a, he's a bit of a partier and he's a bit of a larger than life guy so at one point he bought this guy a car who he's working with at the state-run oil company the guy saw a car and he says yeah we'll, we'll get it and that was was what really led to the downfall. They were going through his emails, and they and they saw this invoice for this car, um, for this car payment. And it's funny how just ordinary human stuff like like greed and and sloppiness and and cheating on your on your spouse. It's always those just ordinary human things that bring down even the most intricate of schemes. This led to their arrest, and then we saw a judge comes into the picture. Now he's almost a folk hero now in Brazil. He's still in charge of the investigation. Very famous judge. And one thing he started to do was he would basically just deny bail to even the richest of, of these criminals. And he would say, well, look, they, they're rich, they have means, so obviously we have to deny them bail or they'll flee. Now his critics say, no, he's just denying them bail, so they have to rot in jail, and they're not used to jail. They're not accustomed to, to being in jail, being around criminals, so they're going to crack and they're going to and they're going to want to want to save themselves to say anything to get out of jail and this is how they've been able to get so many convictions and the the investigation has been so powerful now the response to that is well but uh, that's true for anyone so so for poor people if you're not able to get bail and you have to rot in jail for all these all this time before before your conviction well you have the same incentive to want to to want to say anything and confess to, to even a crime you didn't do. So just because you're applying it to the rich now, I, it, it's something that the poor have always had to deal with. And then people say, well, it's different when it's the rich. You know, they're not career criminals. They're just white collar criminals. They shouldn't be around, you know, these, these same criminals. But that's problematic thinking, you know, because that's kind of setting up this double standard that leads to people to commit these white collar crimes because they think, oh, it's, you know, it's not really crimes. And then another big factor that led to this investigation ramping up was the government, some of the people in charge at the government, they actually, initially, they didn't think that, that the investigation would ever come for them. They thought they would be fine. So they, they gave a lot of resources and they gave a lot of backing to this investigation, not realizing that this investigation would ramp up and up and up and suddenly it would come for them. So it's interesting. There's kind of a per perverse incentive for if you're in government to not really cooperate with any investigation because you or someone connected to you, you never know what, what corruption that they've been doing. So anytime you give resources to any kind of investigative body it's, it's what we want government officials to do but it oftentimes that can s s spell your own doom even though it's it's not it's not karmic it's not fair but that's just kind of the way things go and so not only was there this scandal but then there was also a recession so a lot of brazil's economy is based on oil and commodities so the commodities prices tanked globally that had nothing to do with the scandal but the scandal led to a lot of these contracts these inflated contracts and a lot of people being employed drying up and these these unfair contracts they weren't allowed anymore so there's a lot of unemployment a lot less business and stuff happening and there was a recession and usually during a recession governments want to get together or pass some kind of stimulus bill but because there was so much bad blood and so much suspicion and so many people being targeted by this investigation there's really no way the government was going to effectively form a kind of coalition like they've always done and pass any bills so really nasty recession so the only thing worse than the citizens seeing corruption of their politicians and business people is citizens seeing that corruption while also their own economy isn't doing well and they're out of work and a point the show tries to make is the corruption isn't really about any particular political party. It's kind of baked into the, the very fabric and core of the country for a long time since it's very founding, or at least that's what they argue. They say, look, the, right from when, uh, when they declared independence, um, they declared independence, but they made their leader um, the, the son of the, the king of Portugal, and it was an old, old Portuguese colony, and they had royal rule for a long time. They're the last to abolish slavery, so it's just 
a country that for a long time has been based on favors and nepotism and it's very hard to to shake that and the elite really believe that we get this great line in the show where these young prosecutors are are arresting these these people who are corrupt and the elites are just looking with horror and they say well they're young they don't they don't understand the country you know they don't understand how things have done how things are done here how things have always been done here and I love the portrayal of our protagonist in the show, just this dogged investigator. And you see the obsession that to some extent it would take to really bring down any kind of scheme this elaborate and this, this far-reaching. And how the, the, the obsession is a double-edged sword because he goes into a coma at one point. And when he comes out of the coma, he realizes, my first thought wasn't my daughter, wasn't my wife. My first thought was my mortal enemy, the person who I believe is the cancer and the root of all this corruption. So... Like, what does your life become when the first thing you think of, you know, you're, the first thing on your mind is is hatred and revenge and your enemy? So, but nonetheless, maybe that's what it takes to really, really pursue these bad guys and fight evil. And that's a running theme, the kind of Nietzsche quote. Um, if you fight cancer, you know, that's going to have effects on you. You can't, the Nietzsche quote is, those who fight monsters should make sure they don't, don't become one. But here we get the quote where he talks about this cancer, but he also talks about the effects of really fighting this cancer and the corrosive effects that it has on you. I do think it was interesting. There's quite a well-known figure, a cop associated with this, with this scandal, a Japanese cop. And a lot of people would just call him the, the good Japanese and, or the Japanese fed. And he's very famous. He's as famous as that judge I was talking about. People would make, would make massive of him and and wear masks of him um he he dealt with a bit of his own his own scandal as well so maybe that's why he wasn't included or I, i'm not sure why he wasn't included i thought it was interesting and kind of unfortunate it would be it would have been cool to see him in there as well so i'll end the video there so much to talk about i could just keep talking but the video is getting long i'm really glad they're making a documentary about this because i think it's it's definitely got some attention in the international media and there's some english articles written about it but i think it's it's tragically especially in Eng english speaking countries things like watergate you know just get talked about ad nauseum and watergate's important but a scandal like this it's even more topical it's even more timely so i really hope that more gets more get more things get made about this more people learn about it because it's really important